like to introduce our, our next speaker. Um, and this is uh, Dr. Robert Lightfoot from South Georgia State College. Um, I've always called him Sam. Uh, so Sam's going to be here to talk to us today. And his presentation is, Sorry, We Didn't Mean to Break Your Culture. <laughs> so I uh, look forward to hearing what he has to say. My topic today is on cultural destruction. Uh, we have had culture clashes, culture overwhelmings, thank you, uh, that have occurred throughout history. Contacts between two widely separated groups and sometimes the smallest, seemingly most insignificant things that have had drastic effects on the receiving culture. Culture, for a quick review, is all learned behaviors, values, and ideals that comprise existence. In other words, everything that isn't genetically determined and even modifies the expression of genetic determinations. Everyone must eat, but how you eat, what you eat, what you eat it with, is determined. You have material culture and non-material culture, objects and ideas. And uh, when an idea is, or something spreads from one culture to another, it's diffusion. You have direct diffusion, two cultures slam up against each other, indeterminate contact, and sometimes you have stimulus diffusion. You see that they have something, you don't know how it works, but you know you want it in your culture. So you try to make something that does the same thing. We have some unfortunate examples of that through history. Uh, for lack of a better term, these disruptive forces, I decided to use the phrase objects of cultural destruction, or OCDs, uh, for anything that can cause material or immaterial harm, sometimes ideas, sometimes physical objects, sometimes a combination of both. But uh, the key thing is the distortion of the society after the contact. And we hope to eventually be contacting other societies, and I think this is something we should be aware of. Up until about the 1900s, the year you were on, society used stone axes. This is ground stone, not chip stone. The edge was ground on to there by friction. It took many hours to make this. And the people who held the axes were in high status in their society. Everyone had to come to them to use the axes. It was a badge of rank and attainment. Uh, Western settlers moved into the area of Queensland and uh, started handing out steel axes, left and right. Women, children, unattached males, and the entire society collapsed. Its entire social order ceased to exist. Matt? Think about how much work went into just slowly grinding an edge on that. Spam. We're all familiar with this, right? <laughs> However, in Pacific societies, it has become a major food source. No one wants to touch the <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> but uh, returning to the topic, it has replaced other food sources. It was pork was a high status food reserved for special occasions. The people were hunters. Uh, fishers and uh, farmers, and they killed pork occasionally. Spam was brought in, and it was like having Christmas dinner every day. Unfortunately, they have the same problems with obesity, cancer, <coughs> diabetes, and such that we now have as a result of that. And island paradises, you can go there now and see spam displayed in Polynesian restaurants. Now, snowmobiles, snowmobiles? Above the Arctic Circle, the Sami 
are reindeer herders. Snowmobiles seemed like a perfect thing to give this group that was just barely hanging on to existence. We gave them snowmobiles. And what happened was their society is under extreme peril now. They were able to gather larger reindeer herds, which caused overgrazing on the lichens. It also ironically improved the number of predators out there because there was more concentration of weaker prey and it introduced new forms of death, vehicular accidents and snowmobile accidents are now nearly, combine that with suicide because of the loss of old ways, that's about 50% of their unnatural causes of death now within a fairly short period of time. Now, it doesn't just work in one direction where the quote unquote advanced society brings something in and the quote unquote less advanced society falls apart. Sometimes it can work the other way around. Nutmeg. This spice that afflicts us for about half the year around holidays, at one time was more valuable than gold. It caused a war between Holland and England resulted in the formation of the British East India Corporation, which became more powerful than many countries. Uh, thousands of people died. Several governments were overthrown to get this because it was believed that the nutmeg prevented the plague, a real concern. It didn't, but the belief that it was this exotic thing from someplace else became so desired that one of those nutmeg nuts there was worth more than gold. Talking about the Dutch again. Might as well pull the tulip out. <laughs> Tulips. Resulted in an economic uh, bubble because the Dutch went berserk over them. There you had an object that was brought into their culture wasn't brought by any group, but the Dutch became obsessed with them to the point where people were again paying more than gold by weight for the tulip bulbs. It resulted in an economic bubble and collapse that damaged Dutch society. Uh, chocolate and tobacco. That, Figured no need to show tobacco. <laughs> uh, our other examples, upon contact with the New World, the Spanish and then other groups. Spanish contacted chocolate and tobacco first. And then uh, among Native American groups, you also had throughout, scattered throughout North America tobacco use. But the chocolate became basically part of our society now. It's caused a little damage. It's also become integral to many of our lifestyles. <laughs> and the damage done by tobacco. Think about that. So then it was a ritual herb in one society, became something that people couldn't live without in our society. These objects of cultural destruction could be something small, even something tasty and useful. <laughs> No, probably won't give that back, but pass that around. <laughs> I think everybody knows what a tulip looks like, so there's no need to pass that around. And now I'm going to get into an area that may have me taken out and shot. A Bible. Actually, what I was wanting was one of those little missionary pamphlets. Because in the case, two cases I'm talking about next, a misunderstood version of Western religion taken out of context and brought into a different culture caused drastic upheaval. Possibly the largest civil war that ever occurred, occurred in China in the 1840s called the Taiping Rebellion. Uh, it destabilized the Manchu or Qing Empire if you prefer and 
what happened was you had an individual who was probably having a psychotic state, possibly schizophrenic, who after reading a missionary's pamphlet, had a series of hallucinations and decided he was Jesus's brother and he was going to bring heaven's message to earth, attack the local government who he called demon devils, and raised an army that essentially disrupted all of Chinese society and led to the downfall of Imperial China as a stable structure. Now, how many of you have heard of the Taiping Rebellion? Thank you. <laughs> I just see there. I find that it's a hole in our, a lot of people's knowledge. A similar <coughs> thing occurred among the Zosha, a uh, language and tribal group that was actually a full kingdom in South Africa, again, uh, under a period of social stress and missionization, the belief that the ancestors would come back, bring food, drive away the foreigners, and using Christian symbology was undertaken, and the Zosha then went out and promptly killed all of their cattle. Now, this particular society was based upon cattle. <coughs> they destroyed their grain bins, and they sat and waited for the miracle to occur. The, tens of thousands, possibly over 100,000 people died of starvation, and it created a power vacuum that the Zulus, the English, and uh, the Dutch settlers moved into. The Zosha society essentially collapsed and ceased to exist because of, again, a misunderstanding of somebody else's faith, a faith that came from some place else, some time else. How many of you are familiar with cargo cults? Yeah. I knew this crowd would be. <laughs> During the Second World War, essentially Neolithic peoples were subjected to a series of difficult to understand <coughs> miraculous things. First, the Japanese came in with high technology, mighty weaponry, and overthrew the colonial governments that were over the area. For a while there, it was actually seemed pretty good until the Japanese uh, started, uh, shall we say, administering it in a different manner. Then the Americans came with mightier machines, bigger air bases. They'd come in, they had machines that could just level a forest. And there were black and there were white. Remember the lower parts of uh, the Pacific Rim, you have darker skinned people. And they were, to the locals, they seemed like they were being treated as equals. And whenever somebody who was part of the Americans needed something, they just get on the radio and call for cargo and it came. It came from the sky. So the, the the stimulus diffusion, they tried to, once the Americans left, they tried to call cargo again with radios of their own construction. They cleared landing bases. They uh, marched with wooden rifles. And they told the colonial governments when they moved back in, get lost, we're waiting for cargo. And this has gone into the third generation now. And here you have people trying to understand something but not quite getting it the way we would understand it. What's going to happen when we contact somebody else? How much are we going to get wrong? We may encounter new plant and animal forms. Plants. Animals, spices, jewelry. Tanzanite, found in one volcano area on Earth. Imagine somebody finding something like Tanzanite someplace else, how valuable that would become in a hurry. Inanimate foods, flowers, pets, they could destabilize our society. I'm sure some of you at this moment are thinking trouble with triples right now. <laughs> Contact with another culture may bring dangers and opportunities to us and to them. We may contaminate them. 
these OCDs, we may carry ideas that will destabilize their cultures. Now, they may have things that destabilize our ways of life, machines, songs, religions, joys, terrors undreamed of. And it's going to be a two-way street. And we're not really ready for this challenge. I think we can do something about it, though. Human societies are too complex and driven by too many forces to reliably predict, like a physics equation, the effect and spread of a new trait. However, past performance tends to indicate future actions. Before contact, we can look at the examples of cultural contamination and cultural stresses and come up with a series of guidebooks, a series of manuals, check our historical background, all the places that these have occurred. Upon contact, we can have plenty of analogs on how not to make contact. We may have exhausted the lexicon of ways to get it wrong. Using a multidisciplinary approach, we might possibly fail to fail. We might be able to stop this chain of contamination, these OCDs from spreading or being spread. After contact, things are going to be need to be monitored. Identification of troublesome aspects caused by the spread of new technologies and objects might occur. But if you identify them and track them, you might be able to cut it off before you get a gutted emerald phase. I use that rather than apocalyptic phase for certain reasons, because in the gutted emerald, the whole thing was set in motion because Odin wanted the alien artifact. He wanted the thing from outside. Now, the ultimate, ultimately innocuous and beneficial could be separated from the destructive or hampering with minimal social impact. And we're going to need sociologists, anthropologists, archaeologists, media studies experts, economists, medical doctors, psychologists, and folklore specialists. At minimum, there are other disciplines I've probably left out of this. But each discipline has a set of paradigms and ideas and tools that are useful that can advise your more technically uh, oriented expertise. And then we can contribute by working with you and possibly making it a successful venture across the board. In fact, we must contribute. I think we need a multidisciplinary approach and as much input as we can get. I don't think we can leave any area of knowledge out, but we're going to need commitment from the social sciences as well as the physical sciences. Thank you. Very good. Henry Gibson. Yes. <laughs> A few years ago in Colorado Springs, the Air Force University, we did a series of drills to develop a contact procedures book mm -hmm. for just that purpose. Very good. <laughs> I'll my stuff up here. Got some questions. We really need the prime directive. Yeah. <laughs> what I said I was going to take that. <laughs> no. The prime directive, however, has problems because... Um, Kirk keeps violating it? Yeah, <laughs> there's that. <laughs> But if you were to take it to the ultimate extent, the only place that you could feel safe about going is someplace where you couldn't possibly affect anybody else. You'd be a passive observer. Yes. Yeah, so. See a hand back there. Uh, yes, you, you're talking about contact with uh, cultures that we may encounter when we arrive somewhere. Uh, in the event that we go somewhere far away and there is not a culture that we come in contact, we are in effect exporting a culture. Mm -hmm. have, have you uh, got any suggestions to how to think about the composition of the culture that we export? I have some ideas along those lines and um, they're not in this particular piece, but it does worry me because when we do start spreading out, the culture that we have now will change. And you'll probably find some groups actually breaking off into separate sub or even full cultures on their own. And then you're going to have interaction coming back. And I 
think it goes out to Timmy's hand. Sam, you, you, you were targeting our effect on other cultures. Mm -hmm. In all honesty, I think it'd be more concerned for us, the effect on other cultures on us. Mm -hmm. <coughs> we should be. It's a two-way street. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to show what we, these known cases that have occurred. Who's next? <laughs> <laughs> I'll try not to panic. Yeah. Yeah, we've got time for a few questions. Let me slide you ahead. Okay. Okay. I hope that's not a ringtone. <laughs> yes. Okay, but I, I, go ahead. And I'll, uh, I was can. wondering, have they looked at the possibility of what will happen to evolving human culture when it's in an isolated situation. For instance, when we put a colony on the moon, mm -hmm. the driving force for sending people to the moon is going to be, it's very expensive. You're only going to want the best and the top of the line of the people you send there. So you essentially develop a subculture of super geniuses. Mm -hmm. And how is that going to evolve into something that is radically different from what we have here on Earth now? I was talking about that last year on stratification of how you know, we're going to wind up with certain groups being stratified and treated differently. But I have done a lot of work in it, and I haven't seen a lot of work done in a projective manner on that. May yes. I suggest that you present your ideas at city conferences? Uh, city is, of course, the mm -hmm. search for extraterrestrial uh, I, I am saying this because we have conferences and usually for each conference we have two technical sessions. One is about city science and technology, the other one is about societal aspects of city. Now really, by attending many of these conferences, I never <coughs> heard topics like yours to be presented. There were other topics like questioning, are they benign, not benign, whatever, you know, and so on. But your ideas, in my opinion, might be applied to humans receiving a signal. Mm -hmm. yes. so this is for benefit for us, even before for any other country. Mm -hmm. yes. It's just a comment more than anything. Are you familiar with the work of Catherine Kenny? No, but if I can... So she, she's presented at the Saturday sessions and she talks about the clash of two conferences. It's very interesting. Yes. It seems like we have a problem in choosing what subgroups or what people we want to head up different activities. For example, as a soldier, we want someone who's capable, but also someone that can make peace and save face. Mm -hmm. So some cultures seem to split out, Indian culture split out people who are the war chief, if they need one, who have certain abilities. Uh, the Membari, maybe they have a, a priest class, an intellectual class, mm -hmm. and, and a military class. But uh, do we have a methodology for choosing people with the right attributes for meeting other cultures? No, but I think we should get one. <laughs> I think we should be working on that now. The culture that we had originally in the space program was a very military culture, and very disciplined, and it was a product of the times. And as we uncover more things we need to be thinking about, I think we need to maybe revisit that topic. Our culture is good for innovation. If you read our culture's literature, you find the word freedom popping up a lot. Mm -hmm. But if you read the Chinese history and literature, you find the word stability popping up. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it probably makes them a little more inclined to be trying to be stable. Mm -hmm. Yes. Time for one more question, I think, and then we'll okay. go to the next speaker. Uh, given. Oh. No given. Um, I was. I just wanted to, uh, to point out that a lot of the, a lot of times it seems like what happens like that affects the more advanced culture like you were talking mm -hmm. about the the native americans um we took their stuff and we innovated it mm -hmm. and because our chocolate is nothing like the chocolate that no. the aztecs and the Mayans. no we leave out the hot peppers yeah <laughs> um, modern mole sauce is closer mm -hmm. if you've ever seen what the original tobacco looked like, the Native American tobacco looked like spinach. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. we, we took it and we innovated it and we hybridized it and we turned it into something that it wasn't. Mm -hmm. and, and therein seems to lie a lot of the problems behind the usage of the stuff, is what we turn it into after taking it from them. Right. It also bred out the hallucinogenic effects on the Mayan stuff, Mayan tobacco. <laughs> Thank you very much, Thank you. Sam. Very, very